Okay. Okay, so apologies for my voice. Um, I'm going to pick up on some of the things that have been said today uh, because it, I think they relate to what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Actually, I want to talk about a big question for you about the only... Does this work? <laughs> okay. The one question, maybe the most important one, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with your life? What is your passion? Until you have found it, don't settle, as Steve Jobs was saying in the commencement speech. Um, when I was younger, I wanted to be okay, an explorer. Oh, back one. Come on. No. Okay. I wanted to be an explorer, a polar explorer. So that's why I love the Parker speech, because I was named after no Roald Amundsen, a, a Norwegian explorer that was the second to the North Pole and first to the South Pole. And so I love to discover new things, new territories that you may sometimes don't have a map for. And, uh, and, but I turned out to prefer, well, do it for me, please, uh, the entrepreneurship career. And I think right now is, is a time where a lot of people uh, are dreaming about entrepreneurship. Who in this room wants to be an entrepreneur of some kind? Raise your hand, please. Uh, ah, okay, a few, not that much. I'm going to try and convince you that just about anyone can be at least a co-entrepreneur participating in an entrepreneurship venture. Okay, next one. And I'm going to try and offer you some new glasses, a new way at looking at things. Um, obviously, this is influenced by my own glasses. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I, as, um, as I was introduced, I, I did study at Stanford. That was a, a short time, but it was very intense in 1999, right in the middle of the, the internet growth and the first bubble. Uh, I was involved in a number of uh, startups, and I worked with a number of uh, startups all over the place. So this comes from my experience meeting uh, tens of startups every year and entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, I'm very influenced by this. This is a picture I could have taken uh, back in 1999. Google was uh, the other side of the street in Palo Alto. It was a 40 people startup. I could have walked there and say, hey, how about I open Europe for you and you give me 1% of your company or something like that. But I didn't because I was uh, too brave or too bold or too crazy and I wanted to do my own thing and my own startup, which raised uh, $4 million, uh, merged uh, email and mobile phones three years before BlackBerry, and ultimately exploded in the internet bubble. So I was right inside of it. Okay, next one. Okay, what is an entrepreneur? There are several definitions. Uh, one that I like is, is someone that steals office supplies from home and bring it to the office. But a more serious one is this one. Someone allocating resources to change something, to build something in a sustainable way. Of course, also in a commercial sustainable way. Uh, entrepreneurship is obviously on the rise. Some people say that it's the job of the future. You know, it used to be that people coming out of a business school like this one or engineering school would go work for large companies, for Electrobel, for Fortis, and you know, because it was safe and everything. Uh, and now more people are tempted by the entrepreneurial uh, track, uh, even in large companies where it's called entrepreneurship uh, un until you <laughs> get out of the company. Okay, uh, first of all, I I'd like to debunk a couple of assumptions about business, you know. Uh, the first one is, oh, a startup is like a, a big company but smaller. That's what was used to help startups until very recently. Oh, it's like it's the same animal, it's just smaller, so let's apply the same thing and do your business plan and things like that. And recently, I mean in the fa past five years, Pretty sudden it's not the case. A startup is a different animal startup. I hear voices. It has to be invented. I'm really sick, I think. <laughs> um, we start to... Oops. Blue screen, see, this is... <laughs> I'm no Bill Gates, but I can do a blue screen. Um, and now we start to realize that it's a different type of animal. A startup is learning to be a company, to become a company. And it, it's a very important difference. Okay. Uh, another assumption is that most, <coughs> most metaphors that are used for business are based on war. And metaphors are very deeply ingrained. You know, it's been like this for for centuries uh, since, you know, Darwin has told us that uh, the struggle for life, you know, and business is modeled after that, it's social Darwinism. You have to fight to, to get on top of things. Um, you can have this book uh, recommended in business school as well as in military academies, you know, The Art of War and The Prince. 
So this is very prevalent still in the business context today. Uh, in the vocabulary, we see customers as targets. You know, we have to go after them. We want to keep them captive we, because we have a killer feature or, or a killer strategy. And uh, it's going to take a while before we can uh, mitigate this, uh, this, this kind of metaphor. But until then, no wonder that we've driven our planet into to some kind of a wasteland. Okay, so I want to offer you a new pair of glasses to look at things differently, right? Uh, well, this could be a pair of glasses, and you would see things differently, <laughs> and you would rebuild the world. <laughs> But I, I'm not talking about this one. I, I'm talking something more like this, you know, a new way, a different way to look at things. And co is the word. I think you've heard it in uh, Lisa's speech about co-working. You've heard it in uh, Loic's speech about uh, collective intelligence. Co means together. We do more and more, we're more and more driven to do things together instead of fighting each other. And this is uh, found in, in a number of uh, trends that you can see today that, that are converging. Um, the, the need for connectedness, uh, for collaboration, co-working, consciousness, and it, and it, it evokes an, another uh, number of concepts like tribe, uh, crowd, energy, purpose, and so on. And so I wanted to suggest a few steps in, in this road. How can we better connect it in our entrepreneurial path? Connected to oneself, connected to a tribe, connected to customers because it has to make business sense, connected to the planet, even connected to funding, which is always a big problem for entrepreneurs. And ultimately, you know, we can dream of the greater good, uh, something that, that is beyond uh, everything we, we see and expect. First, connect it to yourself. I think this is very important. I cannot emphasize it enough. I see a lot of people running around, oh, I have my project, I have this project, and they run from Café Numérique to Beta Group to uh, here and there. And, uh, but they are not they're not anchored, they, they, they don't know how deep their desire to build a startup is. And so this guy doing meditation is, is chosen on purpose. It's, it's a way to reach and tap into your, your inner energies uh, before you go into an entrepreneurial journey. And when you go to Guichet de l'Entreprise, they never ask whether you uh, meditate or something. They oh, what, what is your, uh, do you want to do an SPRL or an SA or uh, something like that, you know. Th I think this step is very important. Uh, here I'd like to mention Tony Schwartz, who, who wrote a number of books. He's also the guy who said, don't manage your time, manage your energy. Based on four uh, main cylinders, which they put in a pyramid here, I don't know why. You know, the physical, uh, your physical state, you know. Sometimes the best thing to do for your startup is to put on a pair of sneaker shoes and go jogging. So it will free your mind. Uh, your emotional state, you know, I see a lot of entrepreneurs that are almost burned out because... Uh, of the stress, and they don't have their emotional balance anymore. Same goes with mental uh, abilities, the ability to focus, and even spiritually. How does this fit in the greater scheme of things? This is something that you never hear in almost any of the startup uh, uh, programs, you know, and, uh, but I think it's very important. Yeah. Well, if you want to go further in, in consciousness, there's this model that I love from Richard Barrett. Uh, levels of consciousness of the enterprise. I used to think that it's, it was meant for large companies or uh, like, like the, the one that Laurence works for, you know, they have a CSR department and everything. And then you can try and move up, you know, from the survival mode, which is where 90% of the companies operate. It's based on fear and there it's, it's a battlefield. There the battlefield logic applies. But you want to move up and, and uh, take care of relationships, of self-esteem, of transformation of the business and then you move up in, in consciousness. And I think this applies also to a one-person company. It, then once you're well connected to yourself, you can connect to your tribe. Uh, well, Seth Gotten has, has uh, written a wonderful book about it. But I think if you've looked at uh, Tony Heaven earlier on in the day, he has a tribe, right? It's obvious. He has, a, he has built a following with what he's, he's putting forward. Uh, and I think any one of us who has a strong enough desire can start to assemble a tribe of people around it. The, the optimists have done the same thing, right? Started with Luc Simonet and his daughter, and uh, a few years later, they have 6,000 6, people in the tribe and in several countries. So connect to a tribe, it has to happen in physical space, right? Like co-working space. It has to happen on, uh, on social networks, 
And there you can have all sorts of consultants that would tell you, oh, you can have this recipe to build more Twitter followers, and here are two, uh, a personal branding expert that will tell you how to improve your cloud score. But back to basics, it's very easy. Uh, like Frederick said also, listening, talking is about listening. And uh, this guy, more than 50 years ago, already said things that are still valid today on social network. Just behave, listen, talking to the other person's uh, frame of mind, and you will be... Uh, you will uh, succeed in the network. Okay, connect to customers. It has to be make business sense, right? We are, uh, uh, it's a commercial enterprise. Customer development is a very important concept that is part of the lean startup model. It addresses the fact that most startups don't know what, what problem they are solving. It may sound strange, but when Twitter started, they didn't know what they were going to be about. When users started to use the at sign, it was not a feature of Twitter. It was coming from the users. Only by listening closely to your users can you have a feedback loop that allows you to integrate and to involve your customers into your, your product definition and make sure that it fits with your customers' expectation. Another example that I love is uh, Spreadshirt. I'm sure some of you know that. It's a, it started in Germany uh, for, one, for a change, you know, not a, not a, not a US-based example. Um, they sell T-shirts with great designs. They have no, not a single designer in home. Every design is uh, suggested by external designers who, who put their uh, designs on, online and they get reviews and likes and stars and everything and a cut of the, when it's sold, they get a cut of the, of the fee. It's so successful right now, they have 30,000 new designs every week that are submitted to the site. So this is, you can involve very closely your uh, customers into the process. And of course, each and every one of those designers become himself a, a proponent of, of your products, right? Okay, connect to the planet, I'll, I'll, I'll go uh, very quickly on that. Um, we live in a green age, obviously. Have a look at the cradle to cradle model. You know, it's about recycling indefinitely, not, not using recycled things, but recycling indefinitely. Connect to funding, this is probably very important. You know, once you launch a new venture, Finding funding is always uh, a hard part. The banks are really tough to convince to get into risky ventures. Business angels are not people with you know, wings in, in, in their back. Um, there's this new trend of crowdfunding. Uh, the best example probably is Kickstarter in the US uh, where you can put your project and ask people for donation or contribution. And once you have reached your target amount, then you put it into production and, and you, sell, you give back to the people that have supported your product. Uh, an incredible example is the Pebble watch. It's a really cool watch. It, it connects to your iPhone and so on. They were looking for $100,000 to launch the project, to have it built. And they got 70,000 followers and, and backers, and they raised $10 million. So it's, this is more than they could have raised in venture capital. So this is really a deep change. I think it's... It's comparable to what uh, e-commerce was in 96. You know, this is going to happen more and more. It's also happening in Belgium. You probably know uh, Aka Starter, formerly Aka Music, or Sandawe, who do the same thing for music, uh, music tracks, and for uh, BD, for uh, comic strip albums. As an artist, you only do one or two tracks, one or two demos. Then you find people that support you, that pre-order pre your, your future work, and then you can get working once you have reached your, your, um, your uh, target amount. Another way of having in raising investment is through in shares. So uh, those are two Belgian initiatives, my first company and uh, my micro-invest. And so each and every one of you can contribute, can be a co-entrepreneur in, for example, in Sebastian's venture in medical uh, electronics. Um, you can become a shareholder of his company. I think this is going to be really as big as uh, our fathers investing in the uh, stock market 20 years ago. It's going to be each and every one of you, of us, investing small amounts in, in startups that we like or we find valuable. And my, my micro invest is perhaps more interesting because you partner with large business angels and then you can raise above the limit. Here you're limited to 100,000 euros. Here you can go 1 million, 2 million, and almost the sky is the limit. And then the last step is connecting to the greater good. This is really tough, uh, out of reach for most, most entrepreneurial venture, unless you're the Red Cross or, or, or MSF or maybe the, <laughs> the Optimist and Boon. 
uh, if you're interested in that, you should have a look at Wisdom 2.0 conference in San Francisco where they mix Google engineers and Facebook and Buddhist monks and people that are in, in mindfulness. Amazing experience. So as a conclusion, I hope that I've managed to, to draw your attention on some aspects of the definition of an entrepreneur. Um, you know, we can come back to that. It's allocating resources, but each and every one of you has as a main resource your, your ability to connect, to be connected to yourself and to find your renewable source of energy, right, uh, inside of you. Um, from there, to connect to a tribe with what you have to offer and to, to gather a following. Uh, among this tribe, you will find some people that, that are customers or that can co-create your, your next product. Um, of course, you pay attention to the planet. If you need funding, you can get it from the, from the internet or you can be a supporter of someone else's project and ultimately uh, help the greater good. So with the same definition of an entrepreneur, I, I'm, I've tried to show you that it can be supported by connectedness, by being on the social network and by uh, practicing this, uh, this connectedness in a sustainable way. And I, I wanted to, since we're in the Olympic period, I wanted to uh, end up with the quote by Pierre de Coubertin, the most important is not winning, but taking part. And I think that each and every one of you can take part to your own venture, to each other's ventures, and become also, in a way, co-entrepreneurs. Thank you.